We humans are imperfect creatures. We often fail and make mistakes and despite our best intentions, cause harm to others. And this is no less true of people who came before us. Indeed, with the benefit of hindsight, it is easier to see just how fallible and sometimes outright evil people were in the past, which is why we must sometimes judge and condemn our past. In studying Friedrich Nietzsche's philosophy of history, we've seen that we must approach history in three ways. First, we look to truly great men and women of the past whom we should emulate in order that we too might become great like them. Secondly, we look to the past to see where we came from, and so that we can have a sense of how meaningful we are and how rich our present world is, thereby rooting ourselves in the present. But sometimes we also need to condemn those great people, and we have to reject our roots. And this is Nietzsche's third use of history, which he calls critical history. Nietzsche writes, If he is to live, man must possess and from time to time employ the strength to break up and dissolve a part of the past. He does this by bringing it before the tribunal, scrupulously examining it, and finally condemning it. Indeed, Nietzsche goes so far to say that every past is worthy to be condemned, because every past event of human history involved human weakness and violence, that there is no such thing as a perfect nation or people. Every past falls short of perfection. And so we have to judge them, and we often have to reject what they did and said. And this is something that most of us realize. We know all too well the aberrations of chattel slavery, legalized discrimination, colonization, and imperialism, etc., etc. You'll probably hear a lot about the faults of our civilization because, to be frank, we have created a culture in the West that despises what little of its past that it knows. It learns about history and teaches history only to condemn history, looking down on the past with contempt from a position of supposed moral superiority. So much so that I don't feel the need to further emphasize the need for criticism. Our culture already criticizes the past probably too much. So I think a better use of our time would be to focus on what Nietzsche identifies as the dangers of criticizing our past. Dangers which very few people really talk about. And Nietzsche goes on to argue that when you set out to judge the past, especially when you want to break it up, you're doing something very dangerous. Because when you judge the past, especially of your own people or your own nation, you are passing sentence on yourself. Nietzsche warns us, For since we are the outcome of earlier generations, we are also the outcome of their aberrations, passions, and errors, and indeed, of their crimes. It is not possible wholly to free oneself from this chain. If we condemn these aberrations and regard ourselves as free from them, this does not alter the fact that we originate in them. So criticizing our history and our systems is a kind of self-destructive behavior. To condemn the past is to condemn ourselves, insofar as we originate from our past. Although those who criticize history are often unaware of this, they see themselves as distinct from the events of the past. They are like Oedipus, who kills his own father without knowing who he is, and goes on to pledge that he will punish the patricidal criminal who incurred the plague of Thebes without realizing that it was he himself who was the criminal. Or you might compare them to Pip from Great Expectations, whose advantages in life, unbeknownst to him at first, come from the labors of a convict. Yes, people in the past did things that were very wrong, but how are you going to judge them when you can only see because you are standing on their shoulders? It's not a simple thing by any means. A part of me wonders whether having a contempt for our past doesn't lead to a kind of existential self-loathing among modern people that is just one of the subliminal reasons why we are so heavily medicated and uh, therapied, so anxious and depressed, especially when it comes to the upper and middle class educated elites who have become such snowflakes. This is a topic I eventually want to explore more, but I'll simply say for now that I'm compelled by arguments from cognitive behavioral therapists, pioneers like David Burns, MD, who argue that depression is fundamentally not a chemical imbalance, but a result of how we think. They link depression to certain thought patterns, patterns which cause mental pain and mental weakness. And when we look at media, journalism, and universities, we find that the same thought patterns that cause depression in individuals are used to think about and evaluate our historical past. That's my opinion, and I think it's possible that's why we are such a depressed culture. But the danger is not just mental, it's also physical and has ramifications in the real world. It's often pointed out that revolutions inevitably eat their own children, 
critical movements consume themselves. It must be so, for revolutions are inherently self-destructive. As Nietzsche says, we originate from the aberrations and crimes of the past we seek to reform. Revolutions accuse their own countries of a crime, whether it be oppression, systemic injustice, what have you. But in order to accuse your country or government of a crime, you must unwittingly implicate yourself. You cannot change the fact that you are a product of the present system that you criticize, and that makes you complicit. Although you may not be aware of your complicity today, you can be sure that someone else will recognize it. The witch hunters are always eventually accused of witchcraft. Today, it may be that Danton goes to the guillotine as an enemy of the revolution, but tomorrow, or the day after that, it will be Robespierre. And this is why someone like Edmund Burke, who watched the French Revolution and the Reign of Terror unfold from across the English Channel, insisted that while political change is necessary, it must be slow and incremental. We must be reformers, not abolitionists. Or if abolitionists, we must abolish slowly and carefully. The best we can do, says Nietzsche, is to confront our inherited and hereditary nature with our knowledge and through a new stern discipline, combat our inborn heritage and implant in ourselves a new habit, a new instinct, a second nature, so that our first nature withers away. We should attempt, according to Nietzsche, to give ourselves a new past, a past from which we would have liked to originate, rather than the one from which we did originate. Again, a difficult endeavor, for it is difficult to know the limit of denial. How far must we deny our past? How many statues shall we tear down? How many systems shall we abolish? Shall we deface all our founding fathers, banishing their faults along with their ideals? Shall we become an unhistorical people who consign the past to hell and move only forward without any foundations? Such iconoclasm and reformation, even with the best intents, is never but a few steps from disaster. For even with the most unjust and damaging institutions, we have at least the benefit of knowing how bad they are. But when we set out to destroy or change them, especially by means of novel innovation, we do not know how bad they yet may become. It may become much worse. And so it was with the French Revolution. Conditions under the monarchy may have been unjust, and the people may have been starving and oppressed, but the revolution made it worse. I'm not sure how many bellies the revolutionaries filled, but I know how many heads they took. According to Encyclopedia Britannica, during the Reign of Terror, at least 300,000 suspects were arrested, 17,000 were officially executed, and perhaps 10,000 died in prison or without trial. And this was surely worse than King Louis's inept monarchy. We must always remember that there is no injustice so bad that it cannot be made infinitely worse by a bad remedy. This, in my opinion, is the entire history of socialism and fascism. Ideologies which have sought to repair injustice, or what they perceive as injustice, but have only made things worse. We must remember that Nazism, the National Socialist German Workers' Party, was, conceptually speaking, a progressive rather than a conservative social justice movement that sought to redefine German society. It was novel and innovative, not right-wing or conservative, and the consequences of this progressive innovation for both Germany and the world were devastating. But mentioning these historical movements reminds us once again that it is necessary to condemn the past. We must condemn the French Revolution and fascism and communism, and capitalism too, wherever it may be at fault. But we go forward cautiously and slowly as explorers crossing a frozen lake, and I would suggest tying a lifeline to the past for safety's sake. I think Edmund Burke probably identifies the best approach. To avoid, therefore, the evils of inconstancy and versatility 10,000 times worse than those of obstinacy and the blindest prejudice, we have consecrated the state that no man should approach to look into its defects or corruptions, but with due caution. That we should never dream of beginning reformation by its subversion. That we should approach to the faults of the state as to the wounds of a father, with pious awe and trembling solicitude. By this wise prejudice, we are taught to look with horror on those children of their country, i.e. the French, who are prompt rashly to hack that aged parent in pieces and put him into the kettle of magicians, in hopes that by their poisonous weeds and wild incantations, they may regenerate the paternal constitution and renovate their father's life. 
Spoiler alert, it didn't work out so good for France. Given the fact that the British government has killed a lot less of its own people than the French, Germans, Russians, Chinese, and even the Americans during their abolition-induced civil war, I think I'll stick with Burke's advice, for the sake of my own health.